just time and it seems like it's settling down now hey chat um sorry i don't i don't know what's going on today um this should have never happened honestly um we're gonna try this one more time if it does freeze uh we're going to reschedule this for next week uh obs completely crashed on me a million times so far and uh, I'm not sure at this point why it's happening. I'm not recording anything on my end. Uh, my settings haven't changed since last time. Uh, we're going to give this one last try. If it does happen, then we're going to uh, switch over to next week and maybe hopefully by then I can figure it out. I apologize about this again. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, lucky for us, it happens during the introduction and not during the recon part. But I'm going to summarize what you were saying about recon. So your entire recon methodology is going after... Um, not going after subdomains and mostly going after uh, endpoints. And you said that you like to, you have automated about three to four programs that you continuously monitor. And you said you, you instead of looking for different assets to uh, bring in like subdomains, you would prefer to go through the JavaScript files and heavily differentiate what new things have came in scope or came into that. And right about when I asked you, how do you pick what JavaScript files you want to go after? Our stream crashed. I feel like this is a secret to hacking and the hacking gods don't want us to fucking talk about it. Like the moment I watch, I'm going to ask you this question one more time. This is the third time I'm asking this question. If it freezes, we are doomed, my friend. All right, chat, fingers crossed. We're going to do this again. As you were saying, uh, for the third time without any issues, hopefully this time, you said that you go after JavaScript files. What, how do you decide what JavaScript files to monitor? Is it everything and everything in there or is it particular ones that you go after? <laughs> oh God, is that what, let's, we'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> talk to me about, uh, talk to me about how this works. So basically, when I'm uh, starting on a new program, I'm using the platform or application or whatever okay. for at least a day, uh, just as a regular user to understand its functionality, uh, to learn about the endpoints and stuff like this. And after I get this uh, kind of complete picture of the application, I'm starting to picking um, JavaScript files and probably also other endpoints which are disclosing uh, for, uh, other endpoints, just like okay. HTML files or whatever and put this into my recon tool. And this recon tool then automatically uh, scans, uh, loads, and requests this um, endpoint or file um, every now and then. So basically uh, every day at least. And automatically searches for links within this JavaScript file and uh, adds this to my database, uh, which then did, does some uh, size comparison checks and uh, basically to monitor if something has changed and uh, alerts me via Slack and email. So. So are you, you so you you're using webhooks through Slack to monitor all these changes? Yeah, exactly. Okay, walk me through the process. You see a new endpoint pop up. You know, Slack sends a message uh, in your yeah. thing. What do you do with that new endpoint? Uh, no, no, Slack doesn't uh, doesn't send a message right from the from the start. So basically, what happens is uh, my tool discovers a new endpoint within a JS file, for example. Uh, it queries this um, endpoint to see if it knows it already because I'm keeping a database of all known endpoints and all functionality. Okay. And if there's any kind of, of, of change in the behavior after the second scan run, just like um, the, the content length has changed, the response time has changed, uh, what else? Uh, stuff like this. Uh, if this changes, then uh, the, my, my tool actually uh, sends me a notification via Slack and via email um, about this change. And then I'm going manually into it and uh, seeing like, how, what what did change actually, and uh, is it possible to exploit something? So this is the manual part, and the other one is the the automated part. Do you use any particular tools like? So I know um, I think it's called Arjun A R J U N. People use that for parameters. So you, you find parameters on different endpoints if you don't find those in the JavaScript files. Do you use any sort of like parameter sub brute force uh, parameters brute sorry parameter brute forcing tools? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm basically using uh, FHuff. Yeah, I don't know if to pronounce it correctly. Uh, this this uh, brute forcing tool where it can like basically uh, brute force every single part of an HTTP request. Yep. Uh, and I'm also using or, or used uh, for quite a while a uh, PowerMath, 
which is a really nice tool um, to brute force parameters. So speaking of tools, do you are there any open source tools that you use that um, it's in your tool bit tool belt that you use every day? You, you would recommend to other people to use in their uh, recon? It's but it most like ninety percent of my my tool work is uh, FFOF. Wow, brute forcing everything. So uh, because I, I mean I'm I'm also using like Metasploit and stuff like this, but this is really um, occasionally. So the the most most goes for FFOF. Okay, how do you use F of? Are you just giving for parameter? Just put fuzz, and then you have a word list. Like, how did that word list come up? Did you make it your own? Did you get it on set yeah. list? Yeah, no, no. Uh, my word lists are usually um, I'm, I'm building them. I've got a basic word list which contains like exposed uh, Git directories, like config file backups and stuff like this. And I also have a word list per target, uh, which I'm also building per target um, by extracting. Um, like uh, names or whatever um, occurs quite frequently in the in the in the source code. So if like if you open up the start page of a program and you see the word, uh, for example, Ben five times, then my uh, my script will actually catch this uh, this word Ben and adds it to the word list. So this is like a quantitative um, approach to create my word lists. This works mostly well, but yeah, there could be better approaches. I'm aware of this. So tell me why is it important to because you know I also say the same thing like the word list you create you should have a unified word list for all your targets like your basic right and then you should create word lists based on that target why is it important to have those because uh, especially if you uh, get to know about a certain structure of uh, for example an API um, companies tend to use um, specific screen structures to to I don't know like internal underscore user, internal underscore company, stuff like this. And if you get to know this structure and, and this format, uh, you can build a very specific word list and probably get uh, on, onto other APIs which use the same structure. And this is, um, I, I had really a lot of success with this uh, way of, of doing uh, brute forcing. Interesting, okay. Um... Cool. Yeah, I mean, when it comes down to brute forcing, people do it differently. I recommend people that don't have their own word list to go after sick list because it gives you the baseline of the things you need. Do you use sick list, by the way? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I must admit that my, my main word list is a combination of sick list and some um, other stuff, uh, but it relies on sick list. I, I really like the work of the dudes, um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've done a lot of good work for just doing recon it makes it easy it's just yeah um i don't think it matters where you get your word list as long as you know how to use it i think that makes a huge difference um but yeah a lot of the th one of the most frequent questions that comes up on my stream is can i have your word list and i tell them dude i just made this based on this target for yahoo like some of the stuff that i have on there is from Cyclist, but i've you know i can't just share it because you know i show it on the streams because i've been it's years of work Exactly. Uh, I get this question regularly via Twitter and Slack and whatever. So people asking me to to share my super secret lead uh, work list. <laughs> but uh, I mean, um, I, I'm doing bug bounty full time. So this yeah. is basically my, 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 my source of income. Right. And I cannot share and no company on the on this earth would do this, uh, share company secrets to um, the public for free. So yeah. this is not working because otherwise my whole business will go like uh, down the river. Let's take a pause from hacking and uh, recon for a little bit and talk about something a little bit different. Uh, let's talk about education. Do you did you go to school at all? Did you go to university? No. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I'm kidding. I've, I've been to school, uh, but I, I don't have a university degree or some something like this. So um, in Germany, Germany, you basically have uh, like uh, different steps you can go. Uh, and you can quit quite early to to go after a a a, a job. Uh, you can also go to university and stuff like this. But I don't. I've, I've quit school and um, uh, I learned a uh, how to say in English. Um, I learned a a basic IT job and uh, basically learned everything by myself. So I'm a self taught self -taught, taught person. Do you have any certificates? Any OSCP or SWE? CH? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually an, an OSCP holder. Um, okay. So this is my, I, I've done this for 
I don't know, it took me a year or so to, to go for this um, exam and it was really a challenge, but it uh, brought me forward in a way that I got my first job just because of the OSCP. Wow. And I'm currently doing the OCE. So right now I've, I've just signed up two days ago um, to, to, to go the next, uh, the next step because I really like the work of the offensive security guys. And I would recommend this course to every, not newbie, but everybody who's, uh, who got the basics and want to, 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 to do more. Okay, let's, let's talk about OSCP a little bit because I hear a mix of things. I'm someone who has zero certs. I'm on the fence of doing OSCP. And a lot of hackers who join my uh, stream always ask like, hey, is OSCP something that as a bug bounty hunter I should do? Does it help bug bounty hunting? Or does it give you the mentality of some sort to be a better bug bounty hunter? Yeah, it gives a mentality. It probably it doesn't fit 100% because it's really focused on uh, doing pen testing stuff. So you have to break into networks and get the highest level of privileges like root, for example, on Linux boxes. And this is something which is usually not allowed on a bounty programs, right. so uh, so-called p-voting. So this doesn't really help that much, but to get the, re the, 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 the correct mindset, as you said, is one thing that is really uh, helped me at least because you get to know if you don't find any way into the specific application, try harder. And this is their concept. And I really love this. And it brought me forward like a hundred of miles. Okay. So for a bug bounty hunter, who's someone that's very new to pen testing and just web apps and hacking in general, do you think OSCP is a good place to start? Um, yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, as I said, it's not a beginner certificate. So if somebody is completely new to this whole bounty world, I wouldn't go with the OSCP. Okay. I would probably go with the Pentester Lab stuff uh, first. Um, also because the OSCP is um, more expensive, of course, but it's not an entry level uh, thing. Yeah, but someone who has like, uh, you know, solid dev background and maybe solid networking background and wants to get into security and hack offensive security, I think OSCP would be a good place to start. Yeah, why not? Yeah, um, I agree. I, I, there's other certs. Do you have other certs, by the way, besides OSCP? Uh, I've got some very uh, vendor-specific certs uh, due to one of my former jobs. So uh, I've got some uh, HP certificates in the in the area of networking, but this is nothing really related to pen testing or hacking at all. On the topic of learning and knowing things, what is your take on being a decent developer or programmer when it comes down to doing bug bounties? Do you think that's a requirement or is it a plus? Is it a nice to have? No, uh, I don't really think so. I mean, this depends. Uh, if you start with everything, I don't, I don't think that you have to need to have any uh, coding background. If you're going further and trying to automate stuff and, and things like this, then it's probably helpful. But for the hacking itself, uh, well, it depends. Um, I'm, I'm usually coming from a reverse engineering background okay. and uh, where you obviously need assembly and C++ uh, or C++ or C at least. Uh, and there you, you, probably, you, you basically need this kind of, of, of coding experience. At least you need to understand the concepts. But this is something you don't really need, at least in my opinion, for the usual day-to-day -day bounty uh, things, which is mostly web-based. Okay, so let's take a step back. You said you come from a reverse engineering background. Yeah. And were you doing that before you were doing web? Yeah. Okay, how did you get into web hacking and how did you learn all these different concepts to get so good at How did you master these different topics? Uh, so, so I started up with this whole reverse engineering and uh, binary stuff because of pure um, interest. Um, this was like almost 10 years ago, um, where, I don't know, uh, there haven't been any major mitigations in Windows systems, for example, like uh, like DEP, for example. Um, and this was pure curiosity. Um, and then at some point, I discovered PayPal, uh, which actually paid uh, bounties for bugs. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know at that time what I was doing and submitted some really crappy reports about some cross-site scriptings I discovered on some of their random domains and was really happy about my first 500 US dollar bounty. And this is, was kind of this, this point where I uh, stumbled from reverse engineering stuff to 
uh, to doing web app security. Okay. Because obviously with reverse engineering, there are not that many possi uh, pro um, possibilities to, to earn to earn money, at least if you don't work for the NSA or stuff like this. Right. <laughs> so how did you get in, like, how did you learn each, t like, you know, you said you found your first XSS, right? You probably had to learn XSS in some place. Like you had to learn what XSS is. You had to learn what SQL injection is. You had to learn all these different topics. How did you learn it? Did you go and just, was your method of learning by just sitting down and going after PayPal or was it doing some DVWA or Pentester Lab or play CTFs perhaps? Uh, I'm not a CTF guy, to be honest. I okay. have like uh, participated in just one or so. Uh, I want to hack a one CTF, but uh, I'm not a CTF guy. Um, I basically learned everything by myself. So I, I went to Google and uh, base, used it. So that's it. Uh, there's no magic behind this. Um, the OSCP and I've also did some courses from eLearn Security. Uh, they okay. probably helped with this whole stuff, uh, but it's pure curiosity and reading, reading, reading and reading. Yeah, I think you're nailing it on the head with uh, the curiosity thing, man. Like. If your first instinct isn't to plug in whatever you don't know into Google to find the right answer, then I said this before, maybe hacking isn't for you if you're not doing that. Right <laughs> yeah, that's true. I also get a lot of uh, DMs on Twitter um, asking me some really random basic stuff. And um, I, most of the times I'm, I'm also always telling the guys, hey, yes, I could also Google this for you, but this would be a hundred bucks. <laughs> and then they usually stop uh, asking me at Googling by themselves. So this is really important takeaway everybody should be able to google yeah. the basic stuff yeah. they don't need to be perfect in writing super complicated binary shell codes or stuff like this but the basic things like cross scripting or course or same origin or stuff like this it's all, all everything is googleable i mean if you were to ask me six years ago about some of this stuff i would say there wasn't enough resources maybe six seven years ago but nowadays man like every company has its own learning site now every there's, exactly. so, there's yeah. so many blogs out and how to guys and youtube videos and like i have a similar approach there are some times when i get really good questions and i go hmm i wonder if they've googled this so i google for the answer myself and then i ask them hey did you search this on google and they say yes i'm like what did you search for you know ssr for example i'm like the answer you were asking me is on the second result second url on the google page and yeah, it just exactly. blows my mind it's just i think uh i don't know if it's the I don't know if it's that they don't want to do a Google search or if they don't know how to do a Google search. Like you don't know how to properly look for something, but there's no wrong way of doing it, right? It's, it's probably because they are too lazy to, and uh, it's probably easier to ask somebody you already have in your Twitter DMs than doing your own Google search because those uh, professionally looking whatever hackers probably have the answer faster. I don't know. No, it, it makes sense, man. Like, I, I, I agree. Like, for me personally, GitHub and Google searches are what saves me a lot of time. I just have to look it up. Yeah. It's just, what else yeah. am I going to find the answer, right? And uh, Yeah, exactly. And uh, nowadays, it's quite easy to find all your answers. So when I started up with the uh, reverse engineering stuff and binary cracking and stuff like this, it was like more than 10 years ago. Resources uh, back then were like really only a few pages, and it's mostly about IRC and asking other people and working together. Right, right, right. Uh, but obviously times have changed and nowadays everything is at, like, whether it's HackerOne or uh, the other orange company, everybody has his own university style stuff. Yeah. So this, this, this whole binary and reverse engineering thing keeps coming up. Tell me, man, like you've had some really cool findings with doing some binary exploitation. Yeah, I, I love this. And this is uh, yeah. explains my background, basically. I, I love fat client, uh, thick client RCEs and stuff like this because I, I really like to put binaries into my uh, my IDR, for example, and analyze the different ways and discover buffer overflows, stuff like this. And uh, it really makes me really happy because only a few people are probably looking after stuff like this. So let's can you give me a high level how to get started in reverse engineering for when it comes down to actually like doing binary exploitation. Do you have a guide of some sort you can give people that want to get started? Uh, you, so you're talking about the, the basics of uh, reverse engineering? I mean, you know, like, yeah, how do I, if I want to get into just for binary exploitation, if someone who wants to just install a client app and learn how to find vulnerabilities in there, 
what do I need to know? What is the background that I need to know? Is there programming languages I need to learn? Is there tools that I have to learn how to use? Um, what does that entail? Like, what does that include when I want to get it? Uh, so a very good starting point for the all the basics. So how the processor works and how uh, the, the, the memory works uh, are uh, the Coralan um, tutorials, because uh, these guys, I guess they are from, from the Netherlands, uh, are explaining everything quite quite a detail. And uh, this is actually the, the same page uh, or site that I've used to learn uh, about buffer overflows. What is the site um, again? It's Coralan. It's Coralan, written C O R Coral A L A N. Yeah, Coralan. Got yeah, it. yeah, yeah, exactly. Coralan. And it's a Belgian. Yeah, right. It's a Belgian platform. And um, then you can learn a lot about buffer overflows, heap overflows, and the whole ar architecture thing. Um, once you learn this, basic concepts, it's really important to learn assembly. This is like oh. uh, building everything from scratch, but it's really important. Uh, it took me a, a year or so to write my, my own shell codes just using assembly and, and, and bytes. But you need to do this in order to understand this whole concept and the principles. And once you get that, you're free to uh, go after certain bounty programs which offer binaries in their scopes. Okay. And then let's talk about actually finding drones and you know this client side stuff i don't want you to i, I don't like okay, share whatever you're comfortable with sharing um i want to understand what is the mentality like when you have a new client side app install on your box and you want to find phones what is what do you think of what do you think of prioritizing and what do you what is your workflow like so basically i'm, I'm looking uh for three major areas of binary exploration when I'm seeing a bounty program popping up with the binary in scope. Uh, it's first about privilege escalation. Uh, this is probably really, has nothing really to do with reverse engineering, but comes very close. So if an application you're installing your Windows machine or Linux machine uh, uses for some sort of some sort of thing, uh, evaluated privileges for a system or root or whatever, uh, try to find ways to get your, your user rights to the uh, root or system level. Uh, this is usually on Windows, uh, the, the system services, on uh, Linux, it could be whatever, uh, okay. same for macOS. Uh, the second thing is actually um, file imports, because file imports are always, uh, how to say, crappy. <laughs> uh, whenever you, you have an application which can import an, an image file, for example, or I don't know, the, the XML files, uh, stuff like this. You can start to fuss uh, the file format and how the and look how the application actually reacts to this input and probably breaks or just crashes with a random crash dump. And this is a very good, first good indicator that there is something going on behind the scenes. Um, and the the third one is actually um, how to say file handlers. So if a application uh, is associated with a custom URI handler. Just like, um, I don't know, I cannot, I, I would really love to, to talk about my favorite bounty program, but it's actually a private <laughs> one, so I can't. Uh, I know what program you're it, talking about, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, uh, it, on Windows, for example, you can register a custom URI handler, which uh, actually opens your uh, the, the fat client from mm. a typical, from a standard web browser. And it's you can obviously always, to import, export, and this really depends on the application, what is possible with this URI handler. And this re offers a really like uh, huge attack surface. And um, this is what I'm, this is what I love, man. <laughs> I can tell that, man, you seem very passionate about reversing and about an exploitation and you've had great success with it. Uh, and I think- Yeah, I do, I do. And I think it gives you, um, it gives you a super cool advantage. I, I don't know if advantage is the right word, but when it comes down to bug bounties, you want to select people that actually knows how to do this stuff. I think you and Andre were the only two that have come on my show and talked about uh, exploiting binaries and doing reverse engineering. Have you ever yeah, worked with Andre? Not, yeah, and, and no, not, not in the collaboration context, but uh, I've talked to him during one of the last Hacker One live hacking events. I guess it was in LA. And he's yeah. a really super smart guy. And I really 
uh, loves his work and he's doing a great job. And uh, I mean, he's kind of a competitor of mine, but I really <laughs> like him. So, he's a he's, uh, he's, kudos. <laughs> Andre is a very good dude. I, I love Andre. I have so much respect for Andre, man. It's, it's, I can't say enough. You and Andre both because of the things that you have done, but just hearing that, you know, you've talked to him, it's cool to see you guys have talked about this, similar things that you guys do. Uh, on the topic of collaboration, do you regularly collaborate with any hackers? Um, just during uh, live hacking events, basically. But not when you do your uh, regular hacking? No, I, I would love to, but I guess that my strategy is way too, um, way too customized. Uh, I don't know how to say in English, customized for my own workflow. I don't know if this will work. Uh, I would like to try it. Uh, it's prob it's obviously easier during live hacking events because uh, the approach is different. But yeah, I mean, so, I'm open. If somebody comes around, if you, I, I think we should hack together some really cool stuff at some point in the future, probably. Yeah. So who are some yeah. hackers you would love to collaborate with? Uh, I, I like, I, I love SM Security. Uh, he's also an MBH, I guess. Yep. Sebastian. He's a really, I really like him as a, as a, as a guy, he's really, he's an awesome, uh, Andre is also really awesome. Smeagles is awesome. There are so many uh, great people in this whole scene. You are awesome, of course. I appreciate it. I think, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I'm as, uh, as cool as the, the people that you named. Um, they're, they're, everyone that you named has a MBH belt. I still don't have one, as you can tell behind me. I don't and I, I, absolutely, I totally forgot about Inti. Oh, I Inti really is love, a must. Inti, Inti's bugs are so crazy. He's, he got a uh, show and tell every time, at least it feels like this. And he's doing I think he's so, the only one he, that's done it, dude. Yeah, I mean, his bugs, his bugs are so, so crazy. And you sometimes I'm asking myself, how did this guy actually came to the... To, 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 to this idea to, to do a certain uh, action or whatever. It's really, he's, an, he's a crazy guy. You know what's really funny is that, like, I, I don't think the bug, like, I'm not saying this in a negative way. This is a, I mean this in a very positive way, actually. I don't think it's so much of, like, he tries to go and find technical bugs. He just wants to say, how can I find the trolliest, funniest, but yet the best impactful bug at this event by just reading a fuck ton of documentation. I think he spends all eight hours of the event. Sorry, if it's eight hours of hacking, he spends seven hours reading docs and one hour on hacking to just exploit whatever he's exploiting. And clearly he loves emails apparently, right? <laughs> and it works, yeah, right? It works. So I, I want to, I want to get, you know, uh, I want to get in his head. I really want to, I want to be inside of his head for like for one hour just to see how it works. Oh, I, I think I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, too many crazy things going on. And unicorns everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right, let's go back to, uh, let's go talk about a little bit. Um, so we talked about coding. You you know, you mentioned that you don't think it's necessary, but it helps. We talk about certificates. Again, not necessary, but it helps as well. If you want to, you know, if it's your first time getting a job in pen testing, you have a solid background in dev and programming, you can do OSCP. Might be helpful to land a job in security. But with bug bounties in general, what is your advice for folks who know a little bit, you know, there's people that are in IT, you know, there are people that are IT admins, or, I mean, sysadmins, there are developers, there are security engineers who don't know much about hacking that want to get started in bug bounties and learn how to hack. What is your advice on how to get started? It's, it's really only about reading, reading and learning. You have to read uh, basically, every single blog post that you discover, which is which, which talks about a certain topic you're interested in, and reading and curiosity. Uh, I think this is the perfect combination to to get started. Uh, you don't need to expect that you can do everything 100% uh, right from the beginning. Right. Uh, but using this learning uh, and reading approach, uh, most of the uh, questions will solve um, themselves, I guess. Okay. Um, what are some basic tools, or not tools, basic um, topics you think somebody should know before they get into bug bounties? Uh, really uh, important because I do see this uh, problem a lot uh, in my Twitter DMs is the basic concepts of browser security. So especially about same origin, stuff like this, 
uh, the basics should be should be learned first. And if you understand about same origin stuff like this, then you can go one step further and exploit cross site scripting, for example, or whatever. So it's really important to get the basics first. And this many people actually lack this kind of understanding for the basics because they actually think that uh, bug bounty is easy money. Yeah, it's not, man. It's hard work. It's it's not. But uh, one one um, side of the problem is also that everybody's actually posting about his or her bounty money, bounty amounts, which I don't really like because yeah. I'm not posting a single dollar that I've earned with bounty money because it's not what it's all about. It's yeah. about technical things. It's about ways to exploit stuff. And the, the bounty amounts are really uninteresting for me. I don't care if I get 3K or 5K for an RC at, as long as it's an RCE, you know? It's like my attitude towards this, and this is what I'm telling people. Yeah, but obviously, I, the money, the money thing is. I think it's in any industry. People want to get a shortcut to make money. I agree. the The point of, um, I don't. I personally, I'm in the same boat as you. I barely ever post any bounty amounts. I don't screenshot my findings. I screenshot like my inbox sometimes. Like you know, when I hack and I find a ton of bugs, I'm like, ooh, good weekend. Yeah. But I agree. Like. It's not so much. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the money that I make from doing bug bounties, but yeah, sure, obviously, because it, 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 I, I'm doing a living out of this, mm -hmm. and it's it's really from this perspective, it's a really important uh, thing. But it's nothing I'm going to share with the with the public. Yeah, I mean, I th I think the the platforms that allow you to post about your bounty amounts, it wasn't so much to show off the money, the how much money you have or how much money you have made, it was to mostly encourage people to see that there is money being made from it, but I think it backfired and it sent the wrong message. To many people, yeah. Yeah, totally I agree. Good. I agree. Yeah. Um, let's talk about something different. Uh, you are an MVH, obviously, for uh, Hacker One's Life Hacking Events. Um, first of all, tell me how do... I, so I've never been on... I've only been on the hacking side of this, these events once. And, I, and that was four years ago. There was the first H1415 I've ever did before the AOL one that you were at also. Um, that was a th completely different story. We'll talk about that later. How does it feel to fly around the world to hack on different companies and make money and be a part of these life hacking events? What does it feel like being on that side of it? It, it really, it feel, I, I, I don't, I, uh, so there are so many words currently like circulating in my head uh, around this topic because it's really a huge thing for me personally. I love to travel. Uh, I mean, I've been on a world trip for a year, so this is obviously uh, like yeah, pretty clear. <laughs> right. uh, so I like to travel and the, the combination of uh, traveling and hacking is just perfect for me personally. And to meet all these really amazing hackers, just like Inti and Sebastian, which I've uh, mentioned already, it's really, it's awesome, an awesome feeling to sit in a, a remote uh, space somewhere in Los Angeles or Las Vegas or um, London or wherever and hack the shit out of a company, which is also on site. So whenever you get a question uh, regarding something specific, Mm -hmm. uh, especially that's especially true for Verizon. You can just approach the guys and ask and 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 tell them, hey, I thought I found this interesting endpoint. It's probably vulnerable to SSRF. Can you help me out with this? And they are always open to help. And this is this kind of um, direct program feedback, which is really valuable to me. And this is what makes yeah. this live hacking events really really great. The same goes uh, for the um, uh, for Dropbox, for example, which yeah. is one of my my favorite programs. So. On the topic of live hacking events, um, typically you get about a week, 10 days, you know, they give you the scope. And 10 days before the event, you get a scope call, they give you the, you know, the target for that event. Walk me through it. What do you do after the talk? Do you suddenly start running all your tools on there? Do you go and look at the program? Like, what do you do when the scope is given to you for live hacking events because of how competitive it is and how time consuming it is? So uh, assuming it's not Facebook because I'm not participating in any Facebook uh, hacking events. I don't like Facebook at all. Uh, <laughs> so if, if there is a, a live hacking event with any target with, uh, except for Facebook, um, I'm basically, first of all, getting an overview of the, uh, of the event specific targets because usually uh, programs include their um, already public scope um, and add some really unique 
uh, live hacking event specific um, targets. And I'm usually having a look at the, those first because uh, almost all of your customers uh, who are doing these live hacking events um, have been hacked all the time and it's mm -hmm. quite unlikely to have a good return on invest uh, when having a look at the at this already public asset bounty scope thing. So I'm usually going for the for the uh, event specific um, scope first and doing my usual recon on this. Uh, this was uh, especially interesting during my uh, MBH uh, event with Dropbox uh, because I found a really interesting um, how to say a really interesting asset uh, which I guess they haven't. Uh, watched in for a while and exploited some uh, some really interesting things and got RCE in the end. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is not one of the usual assets they have in scope, and this is obviously the way to go. So you just approach this target the any way you would have approached any other targets for the live hacking yeah. events. Okay, so let's go back to another question then. So let's say I give you, we have a live hacking event. The target is something completely brand new I've never looked at. It's start.nahamstick.com. They say, that's it. this is your scope, just an example. Walk me through it. What do you do? That's the scope for the live hacking events. I want to like, I want hackers to understand what that process looks like for somebody like who, who has won an MVH belt. So, so you're, we're talking about uh, start.nahamstick.com? And you know, start a site.com. The, the site.com could be Nahamstick. It could be, it, it's a target that you've never hacked on. What are some things that you prioritize for a brand new target for you know, the seven days of hacking you have before the event? First of all, I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, what part of this scope is actually different uh, from the scopes that are already present for a while. So if, if uh, the target runs a bounty program for like two years or so, I'm trying to separate what's already in the program scope and what's been added during the life hacking event. Okay, maybe I'm not asking and, this properly. Let me, let me reword it. Uh, let's forget about life hacking events. Brand new program you get invited to today. It's a brand new brand program, startastype.com. You have 10 days, so it's a challenge. It's two weeks long. It goes away after two yeah. weeks. You have two weeks yeah. to hack this target. What does that process look so, like? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm obviously starting with uh, subdomain enumeration, uh, yeah. brute forcing. Um, and really, I really love to use Project Sonar for this because they have okay. a really huge collection of uh, subdomains and reverse entries and stuff like this. So this is probably a good, a good uh, way to start. Uh, and then doing brute forcing using Subfinder, for example, which also uses virus total and uh, a bunch of other sources to, to get subdomains. And once I got like this um, database, I would say, of subdomains, I'm going to port, uh, scan every single host of this. Mass scan uh, of this. Uh, and yeah, basically, okay. uh, this depends on the amount of targets, to be honest. Uh, if it's like a really huge uh, slash 16 network or something, I'm using mass scan first right. uh, because it quickly gives me results. Uh, but I'm still scanning using NMAP afterwards because NMAP has a really cool thing which uh, mass scan doesn't have uh, called scripts. Yep. And there's a ton of scripts using NMAP which can be used to, uh, for example, Get the HTTP title. Get the um, uh, this Google Analytics uh, UID stuff uh, to extract all these really important uh, things. And I've got a pre-built script um, having a really long, really long uh, command and that command line uh, executing stuff for me, which also returns a lot of uh, meta information, like. Like I said, that HTTP title, for example. Right. I'm collecting this information also in the, the same database, and then I'm screenshotting the hell out of the target. Uh, basically, everything which is HTTP, I'm screenshotting. Uh, I'm not using a uh, a standard open source tool. I've uh, I've coded my own one to do this. Okay. Um, and I'm screenshotting, and I'm taking note of, or my 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 tool actually takes note of every single re response to. Uh, an initial base request to get to know what technique uh, techniques are they using, like Node.js, or are they using PHP in the best case? Right. Uh, Greet to Joe Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's it. Screenshotting, and after screenshotting, um, I'm picking, I'm trying to pick the hosts that look um, most interesting based okay. on the screenshots and the meta information that NMAP actually gave me. And once I got like a really small list of probably like 10 interesting targets or so, I'm going to dig deep into them using um, brute forcing files, directories, stuff like this. 
Um, one thing that I really love to do is doing vhost enumeration uh, because I've really had a lot of success uh, on Synac programs using this technique um, because people actually forget to remove standard uh, vhost and they expose a shitload of stuff. Uh, how this. do you how do you scan for vhost? Do you collect a list of subdomains and then go after each host and just brute force for it by IP? Like how does that process look like? Uh, I'm, if, if I can tell you one of my really secret secret tools, um, basically when I'm, I have collected this whole list of uh, subdomains uh, using the brute forcing mechanisms, you will always find subdomains which don't resolve to any uh, IP address yep. or which are simply dead. Yep. I'm using exactly this kind of subdomains which are dead and try it in my vhost brute forcing against every single host. Yep. So in in the because I'm I'm actually hoping that the host that is obviously not reachable because it seems dead, because it's the IP is not reachable or whatever, and uh, try to find it on any other host because it actually left a copy there or stuff like this. And uh, I've had success with this. Do it takes a while, but... Sorry? Do you do it with Fuff? Uh, yeah, no, not really. I'm doing this with my own tool. Oh, very cool. Okay, so you wrote something that does it for you. But yeah, you just it's basically much... the same tool that also, uh, also does all these... Um, uh, continuous scanning for me. So this is like a um, all-in-one solution. So you're just hitting every IP address, giving it a host header with the subdomains that were dead, and then looking at yeah. the response. You yeah, know, this is something by. you could also use for your Verizon media stuff. Uh, although you, you, I guess your subdomain list of Verizon is probably like 100 gigabytes or so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm it at 80,000 domains right now, but... Um, <laughs> Someone saying Ben is fuzzing Mr. Chuck's Mr. Chuck's racer's mind. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I'm trying to get all and the secrets said, out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I, I really had a success with this kind of 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 uh, vhost brute forcing. Although it probably happens uh, with uh, one out of uh, probably fifty thousand hosts or so when I get a successful uh, hit. But when I got a hit, I found stuff like um, source code repositories or found Apache, um, Apache stuff. I found hidden admin panels, stuff like this. So it's really worth a, worth having a look. Um, are there any NSE scripts on Nmap that you would like people to try out? I know that it's part of your secret sauce, but are there any obvious ones that you think people should definitely look into? Yeah, especially when it comes to really open scope programs, I would go for the, I don't know its, it's exact name, but there is a script which extracts the um, this uh, Google Analytics uh, UA uh, dash random number string uh, out of the web content, and using this um, user uh, you, using this ID, you can actually use Google to find other assets belonging to the same company. Wow, I've never actually thought of that. That's very cool. That's, that's, awesome, a, that's a good one, especially like for Verizon, it's working. It's working for Tesla and stuff like this. So, wow, very cool. That's yeah. a that's a very good technique, man. I seriously, I've never thought of that. That's very, very um, smart and very unique. And the, yeah. Um. All right. Let's see. I'm going down my list of things that I think. I uh, oh, I want to know about this. So you're a full time bug bounty hunter. You said. Um. Uh, how does that work? Do you? Do you treat it like a day job? Like, do you wake up and work nine to five? Do you, like, I had a, Cosman said he works when his wife's not home and when his wife's at work is when he <laughs> works. <laughs> do you do something similar? Uh, I, I really, by the way, I really like Cosman too. Uh, I met him in, in LA and he's a really smart guy. Yeah. So um, he, he's doing really awesome good work. Um, so actually my girlfriend uh, has to do uh, real work. So she's, <laughs> real work. she's away all the day. And when she gets up quite early uh, at around seven in the morning, um, I'm usually getting up too and starting my day with uh, having a really nice breakfast, stuff like this, to, to just get some, collect some power and then starting like in any other day job, except for the fact that uh, I'm not working like eight hours a day uh, and I'm not working eight hours straight. I'm, I'm taking a break here and then I'm doing a lot of sports uh, and it's really like a bit cluttered, but... I like this way. I mean, it works. How many hours do you think you spend a week hacking? Uh, this really depends on my mood. Uh, so it, it ranges from 20 to 60. 
really wow. it depends on the target if i'm if i'm lazy and i don't have any uh, energy or if i'm or like uh prefer to to get on my playstation uh, i'm usually hacking like 10, five hours a week or so um but there's also times when there's a really interesting program popping up um and where i'm spending a lot more time because it's obviously uh, especially if a new program launches it's about speed I'm except for the neck probably but <laughs> I'm curious to know um, motivation. Like, do you have a goal that you want to hit every month, or is it just doesn't matter? Just as long as you make some money and you know you hack a little bit, you're happy. Or do you set yourself up for a goal or some sort of achievement for every month or week? No, I'm 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 setting myself um, yearly goals. So I'm I'm not a friend of monthly goals because. You know, when you're doing bug bounties, you got uh, you get good months and you get bad months, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there are months where I'm earning nothing, and there are months where I'm earning like 20k. Uh, and it's it's like the at the end of the year, uh, there must be enough to pay my rent, to pay my insurance, uh, and my girlfriend, <laughs> and everything else. So uh, <laughs> this must be must be met. On the topic of having bad weeks and bad months. Um, there are two things that I bring up and it's uh, people react to it differently. The number one thing I ask is, do you deal with burnouts? Do you have days when you just feel like you're completely burnt out on hacking, you want to break? How do you deal with it if you do deal with it? Not anymore, to be honest. Um, I had this years, years ago. Um, I was quite close to a burnout and this was quite a, a game changer for me because I started to to be um, more or to, to live a more healthy lifestyle. Um, I must say that I'm a vegetarian and um, I really like this way of, of doing stuff. Okay. And um, I've, at the point where I was close to this burnout, I um, decided to do a lot of sports because it gives me some kind of, um, you know, a uh, different thing in my life. Uh, except for um, like besides uh, bug bounties. And it really helped me a lot to do this um, kind of sports thing. So you're, you're using sports for a way of clearing your mind and... Yeah, exactly, exactly. And having something and to when, distract yourself. Yeah, and when I'm feeling lost at some point while hacking, uh, I mean, this you probably know this also, uh, there is always some point where I think, oh man, this is really frustrating and I can't get anything to work and stuff like this. And this is exactly the point where I'm stopping uh, getting out of my 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 house, uh, doing sports or whatever, but nothing really hacking related. Um, I've got a really great side thing running with uh, which deals um, with uh, stocks. So I'm really um, I'm interested in financing stuff and, oh. and things like this. And this is really um, an interesting side activity to get rid of this frustration, which is always present in bounties. Yeah, somehow. There's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are you familiar with uh, imposter syndrome? Uh, not really. So imposter syndrome is where you you think you don't know anything about the subject matter where you are supposed to be an expert. So you, for example, in hacking, there's so much things you need to know. You know, when you go to a life hacking event, you see all these other folks who know so much more than you think you know. And you start to think you'd maybe not be as good as you think you are. Do you deal with that a lot? A lot? Yeah, sometimes. But, you know, uh, once you know that uh, there isn't a single person on this planet who knows everything, mm -hmm. um, if you if you like learn about this principle, then it's easier to to go with this. I'm really I mean, when I'm at hacking events, life hacking events, it's really uh, I'm sometimes I'm a bit jealous about other people and the, the work they did. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, uh, it really feels great to be part of this community, especially this life hacking community, because people usually share uh, what they did, how they did it. And this is what brings me uh, one step closer for uh, being a better hacker. I, I know that I won't, that ne nobody is perfect and nobody will ever know everything. Um, and I guess knowing this is the key to, to dealing with this syndrome. Yeah. Um... How do you learn new things when you realize there is a new topic and you realize you don't know much about it? Even with hacking, even with web hacking, how do you keep up with trends? How do you learn the new topics and new um, techniques? 
uh, reading again, yeah. reading, 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 basically. Um, when especially for this um, request smuggling stuff, uh, which uh, James published a while ago, uh, this is quite a complex topic in my opinion. And uh, to be honest, I haven't found a single instance being vulnerable to this kind of attack. Uh, but if you if if there's a new technique discovered and published, read about it. Try to set up your own lab and try to reproduce the vulnerability as best as you can, because this is something I had really great uh, success with, is setting up your own lab uh, teaches you a lot about software. For example, I had, I had the, uh, a bounty program a couple of weeks ago, which dealt with a Magento store, you know, this, this yeah, shop yeah. system, which is like, is it owned by eBay? I don't know, of, uh, this, this Magento thing. And um, before starting to attack it randomly, I started to set up a non-server and try to install this Magento shit and learned that it's a really complicated thing and that you can do a lot of mistakes with it. Okay. And um, reading through all these manuals available and how to secure this Magento stuff, I actually also learned what are the common mistakes that uh, administrators do when installing a new Magento. Yeah. And on this way, I was able to exploit stuff on random Magento sites, which um, they basically forgot. And this is what I'm what I mean reading about new techniques and practicing and probably installing your own lab with your target software is really worth it. Although mm -hmm. you won't be able to make money for a day or so, depending on the, the time to set up your lab, uh, you probably will make a lot more out of it afterwards. Uh, do you take notes when you do stuff like this? So when you're learning hacking Magento, for example, yeah. do you take notes? How do you take notes? Yeah, uh, basically using OneNote, so Microsoft. Yeah. So you just store them based on whatever you do. What kind of notes do you take? Do you, what, what are some things that are, so let's say you're hacking on a target um, while you're hacking, do you, when you take notes, what are some things that you jot down and keep? It's basically um, interesting. It's mostly about interesting endpoints. So whenever I'm dis uh, discovering an endpoint which seems interesting, but, but which I'm not really able to exploit for some reason, I'm writing this endpoint down and uh, try to revisit it as, as, uh, as a, at a later time. So that's why my, my notes are a bit cluttered, to be honest, because I'm writing stuff down here and there. Um, but it works for me, and that's what, 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 what counts. Someone just and, uh, yeah, probably uh, probably also uh, notes about um, things that I should learn in the future because um, there was a time which uh, where I was wasn't really familiar with JavaScript for example okay. and I wasn't really able to write basic JavaScript things to exploit cross site scripting things and then uh, I took the note about this and revisited this uh, half a year later and invested a week or so in just um trying to write some basic javascript and this helped me a lot during cross-site scripting exploitation because my payloads usually don't look like alert one or something mm -hmm. but uh include specific target specific payloads which extract the cookies or crsf tokens or stuff like this wow. to maximize the impact very cool um something's happening hold on i want to make sure there's no more notifications thank you bitcode i think bitcode just uh Gifted you a subscription. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, I want to say thank. So before we, I say thank you to you. Actually, there is a second part to the interview, which is more of a you know casual, just speed fire question. I asked some really easy questions at first, and then the second part is I give you some words, and you just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, it's a wordplay, but the first part is just super easy. It's just mostly about your bug bounty hacking. Okay. Um, first of all, what was the first bug bounty program you ever hacked on? PayPal. If you have to hack on one bug bounty program for the rest of your life, what program would it be? Uh, the private one. I cannot talk about it. Uh, what was the first bounty you ever got? Do you remember? Uh, 500 US dollar from PayPal. Do you remember what you did with that bounty? Uh, actually, uh, I don't know anymore. I, I guess I used it for some, uh, no, I really don't know. It's like uh, it's six years or so ago. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um, what's the best purchase you've ever had with a bug bounty? Do you welcome? Uh, probably, a, probably a car. Yeah. Um, what is your, what was the first vone type you ever found on PayPal? Uh, cross site scripting. Nice. It's also my, the vone type that I uh, probably discover most often. Uh, uh, because it's like a pest. But. Of course, it's never going to go away. 
Yeah, um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> what is your uh, favorite Vaughn type? RCE, of course. Uh, of course. Preferably uh, fat, thick client RCs. Do you want to talk about the RC mentality, how you look for them? Like, is there any advice you want to give on looking for um, RCE or very impactful bugs on how to find them? Uh, this is a kind of um, hard question because there's no general answer to this, I, I, I think. Um, I'm, I'm usually going with the, um, some catch-all payloads, uh, which at least give me a first indicator whether there could be an RCE, just like a sleep payload or stuff like this, or a uh, DNS lookup. Um, but this really depends on the application. There's no golden rule. I mean, a common injection is obviously totally different from a deserialization bug. So, yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Um, what are What is your favorite tool to ever use? Don't say Burfsuit. Burfsuit. No, Burfsuit doesn't count. Yeah, Burfsuit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Burfsuit just was my was my best investment ever. Uh, I know that there are people which are still using the Burfsuit free edition to to hack on live hacking events, <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm a fan of the pro version because the scripts that are available for this version are so amazing, and I also started to write my own extensions, um, which helped me a lot during the recon process. Um, so this is the number one. If I have to choose another one. Uh, besides Burp suit, I would probably choose. Can I choose Python? Sure. If you like coding I'm using Python. Python. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> because said, I'm using Python for my whole uh, recon stuff. You said something about Burp extensions. Are there any Burp extensions that you think people should be using regularly? Uh, there's this active scan, uh, which is uh, quite a good thing. Um, uh what else uh there's um this uh, auth metrics which i really like to test for uh authorization bugs okay. and yeah there are a ton of ton of things including this turbo intruder which is really awesome work um so i could like mention you 20 other fair enough um what about some favorite hobbies besides traveling and sports do you have any hobbies outside of computers or video games or anything that revolves tech uh, um, that does not involve tech? Yes. Oh. Like, uh, I, 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 pro, I, I don't want it to be programming video games, like something that you have to be on the computer okay. constantly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm really interested in, in finance stuff. So as I said, like stocks trading and stuff like this, but this obviously also includes computers at some, at some uh, point. So besides this, um, I really like to play card games. Okay. So if you know Magic the Gathering, for example, uh, I really like this. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so I wanted, this is something that I didn't even expect. <laughs> That's why I asked this question. Like, what do you play? Or what do you do outside of being, like, let's say computers go away, what would you be doing for fun? Which sounds yeah, like you're doing magic. <laughs> yeah, if I, I, I'm not allowed to say sports, so I'm going with the, the card games uh, and board games. I really love this kind what's, of offline of activity. What's your favorite sport? Like, what kind of sports do you play? Uh, like, uh, I'm, I'm doing fitness. So, okay, like uh, you're doing no. weights and cardio. And yeah, exactly. Like, cool. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the second part. I'll give you a word. You tell me the first thing that pops into your mind. It doesn't have to be a word. It could be a sentence, whatever you want to say. And I'll start with Senac. Nice, fast payouts, but a pain to use with the VPN solution. A hacker one. A really great community work and super awesome life hacking events. Uh, live hacking events. Uh, traveling a lot and meeting program owners in person is uh, one of the best things I have ever experienced. Valve. Uh, you know, you you mean this game publisher? Thing? The bug bounty program. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I don't know what the core leaderboard says, but uh, there was a point where I was better than you. <laughs> Did you really beat me on Valve? I'm going to pull this up live. I, I, I just do it. Don't. I guess there was, a, there, was a, there was a moment where I was a, a little bit better, but I don't know if it's still. I almost no, have, okay, no, I have almost double the points, almost. I haven't hacked them in a while. But it was a really fun program. I really love to work on this one. Uh, what about Dropbox? Uh, really nice security team. Uh, a bit sad that Nathaniel, Nathaniel have, has left the company because he was a really um, great guy to, to talk to. 
Nathaniel, you mean Donut, just for people that don't know who you're talking yeah, about. Donut. Yeah, Donut. Exactly. I agree. I'm very sad he left as well. Um, yeah. What about Fuff? Uh, super fast tool, which I'm using on my uh, dedicated gigabit machine and which really does like 10,000 of requests per second. So this is really awesome. OSCP? Uh, quite a tough challenge, not for beginners, but if you've got the basics, go for it. Uh, binary exploitation? My my heart, my love, my my life. No, uh, I, I must be careful because of my girlfriend, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, I, I love this. Yeah, absolutely, man. You, you seem to be very passionate about it, and I really appreciate that about you. Um, Google? Uh, data privacy violations. I'm not using any Google services. Uh, and then last but not least, Nmap. A uh, super cool tool, which is uh, often overlooked because of uh, because of its uh, scripting features. All right, I'm gonna quickly open up the chat. Chat. If you have questions, um, let's do five minutes of questions really quickly, just because I want to make sure um, we cut this right on time. So, if you have questions, five minutes. Uh, drop them in the chat right now. Somebody asked if you look up to anybody on uh, CTF competitions. Do you look up to anybody like that? What do you mean by looking um, up? Who on CTF competitions do you look up to? Like like a, someone who you admire their work? Uh, I'm not really a CTF guy, so I don't I, I don't know. I, I know that Andre is doing a lot of CTF stuff, uh, but really I don't know. Do you I'm have did you CTF. have any did you have any mentors or anybody you like learned hacking from? No, it's just all everything self taught. How was the transition from pen testing to bug brownies? Not that difficult because in pen testing, I uh, basically did the same except for the part where you're pivot to other systems. So the whole recon stuff was basically the same. So the transition wasn't that difficult. Where do you see the this industry with bug bounties going in the next three to five years? Uh, sorry, again? Where do you see the bug bounty community and industry going in the next three to five years? I really hope that there will be more of the big players uh, joining the bounty business because we are currently lacking uh, programs from insurance companies, mm -hmm. from probably banking companies, from the more conservative industries. And I would really love to see them uh, boarding uh, bounty platforms to, to get hacked. Do you use uh, tools like Weppalyzer at all? No. Not do, at all. Do you have? Do you regularly exploit things that have a CV attached to them, like known known components with known exploits? Like a CVE? Yeah. Or like, CWE? So do you look for? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm regularly um, discovering new exploits and uh, getting CVEs for this. Uh, I recently, um, <laughs> I recently uh, stood in a small competition with Space Raccoon, who is also <laughs> really really awesome guy. I like him, uh, and I, uh, I I've beaten him in a program where I discovered like eleven uh, or ten or eleven. Uh, zero days, which I've reported to them, and uh, yeah, they will be published in March, nice. and it got me like eleven CVEs. Yeah. Do you scan for CVEs while you do bug bounties? Uh, not actively, no. Okay. Um, what is your favorite tool for binary exploitation? Uh, Python. <laughs> I know this is a quite a tricky question because uh, binary exploitation involves two parts. First, the discovery of the uh, issue, which is obviously uh, Python to use because all, all my fuzzers are written in Python. And there is the second part, which is the active exploitation, which involves more IDA or GDRA or um, GDB or whatever platform. So it's like a two, a two step thing. What do you use for decompiling binaries? Uh, like decompiling.net, for example, I'm using .peak uh, from JetBrains. And for Java stuff, I'm using JADX. I don't know pronounce it correctly so jadx cool awesome um are you going to any cons anytime soon uh defcon probably if i get an invite for some some certain uh event in the in las, in, in las vegas uh otherwise any local, uh, black, any local ones in germany uh we don't have that many troopers to be honest 
Uh, I've never been to Troopers. It's a bit expensive. Uh, probably go to, to Brucon in Brussels. Okay. Um, but not you, sure. Do you think that future compliance would be put in place to mandate companies to be a, bug a part of bug bounty programs? Like do you uh, this de yeah, I know what you mean. This depends a bit on the country, I would say. If I take, for example, Germany, where I'm, where I'm living, uh, it will be hard to get this kind of uh, legislation within the next few years because um, we are a really conservative country and things take ages here to, to do. It's probably easier in the US, but I cannot speak of the US. Uh, I would really love this kind of, of thing. And then let's do one more question. What's your best advice for people that are transitioning between pen tests to doing bug bounties? Um, don't think that much about pivoting, but go more for the initial phases of the pen test, like recon, like thrive, uh, finding entry points into applications. Uh, I mean, um, exploitable entry points. This is more important in bounties than pivoting. Very cool. Well, hey, man, I want to say thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, apologies for all the technical <laughs> issues we had when we first started, but I really appreciate you sticking through it with me and letting me get my shit together. And uh, no worries, I, I got yeah. one, 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 a uh, one, one greeting in German. If this is okay to my German followers. Oh, please go ahead. <laughs> because you you won't be able to translate this, so don't try it. Grüße an alle Käferjäger. Thank you. Whatever that means, man, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining. And uh, Yeah, uh, thank you, Ben, very much. Thank I, you. I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, life hacking event. I see everyone's laughing at whatever you said. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave it as what it is. I don't know if you're monitoring the chat, but it's going pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it's going on there. I know, I know. This was like kind of kind of a deal between uh, some people and me. <laughs> I've I've seen some of the hashtags that have came under my uh, my post. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it so much, man. Thank you again, uh, and I'm looking forward to talking to you soon, dude. Thank you very much, then, Ben. Man, see ya. See ya. All right, that was a fun interview. Um, regardless of all the problems we had, I'm glad that it worked out and we got to have them on. Um, it's unfortunate when things go wrong, but that's also a beauty of doing a live hacking uh, interview, everything being live. So it makes it kind of difficult to keep up. But uh, I appreciate uh, Julian uh, sticking around and making this happen. All right. It's a little bit later for me than I expected. Let's find a channel for us to to host. And if you don't mind sticking around and supporting him, I really appreciate it. Um, and if you don't, I understand why you don't. But I want to find someone who's doing some hacking um, or security or something with web and hosting him. Give somebody a chance to be recognized and the community as well. Uh, if you have recommendations, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'm going to pick someone at random. But that was a really fun, uh, really, really fun uh, interview. 